what is happening right now is we have a handful of global agri-food corporations that are really shaping the industrial food system. And that is constraining not only the food sovereignty movement, but that is constraining how we can imagine and how we can think about the future. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast. This podcast series tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. My name is Peter Andre from Political Science at Carleton University. My co-host for this series is Ryan Katz-Rosine from Political Studies at the University of Ottawa, though he won't be joining us for today's episode. Today, our focus is on sustainable food systems. Food issues and agricultural issues have come up in quite a few of our podcast episodes so far because they're a really important way that people interact with the environment. Food is also so important for people in terms of day-to-day sustenance. And so our livelihoods and how that interacts with the natural processes and with animals and plants in the natural world is a big eco-political question. And uh, food systems have a huge impact on issues like biodiversity destruction, climate change, and a number of of other environmental issues, as we'll get into today. Uh, We're getting into these issues with two experts in the field of food politics, Dr. Helena Shilombolani and Dr. Sarah Martin. Helena Shilombolani is a PhD from University of Waterloo, and she's now based in Nairobi, Kenya. She's currently doing a postdoctoral fellowship with the CGIAR Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, Helena. Thank you, Peter. I'm delighted to be here. Great. Well, we're delighted to have you here. And with us as well is Dr. Sarah Martin from Memorial University, located in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Sarah's research specializes in the global political economy of food and agriculture. It explores questions about the governance of food and agriculture at the local and global scale. She previously worked as a cook and a chef and a meat cutter in a variety of settings from institutional cafeterias to high-end restaurants to remote logging camps. And all of that work led to a particular interest in how food politics is practiced in the everyday and the tensions found within the global political economy. Welcome to the Ecopolitics podcast, Sarah. Hey, thanks, Peter. I'm really uh, happy to be here and part of this conversation. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm really happy to have both of you here, and uh, I just want to get right into it. So, Sarah, let me start with you. Uh, For students new to thinking about how food systems and the environment interact, how would you sum up the big picture of where global food systems are at and to what extent they are sustainable as we know them today? And then what do you see as the major challenges affecting the sustainability of of our increasingly globalized food systems? Uh, Those are great questions and big questions. Um, So let me try to break that down a little bit. First of all, there's lots of different food systems and they have lots of different capabilities or capacities for sustainability. Um, And of course, we can think about sustainability in multiple ways. So I want to talk about sort of two systems, two sort of food systems that have different capacities for being sustainable. So let's go from the least sustainable, or I would argue the least sustainable, uh, to what I would argue is the most sustainable. The least sustainable food system is the one that most people who live in the global north are dependent on. And that's what we typically call the industrial food system. Um, And increasingly, folks in the Global South are dependent on this system as well. Um, So what is an industrial food system or what are the characteristics that make a food system industrial? It's, I would say it's the same characteristics that make it unsustainable at multiple scales. So first of all, an industrial food system is input-intensive crop monocultures and industrial scale feedlots. So think about animals and um, those big feedlots we have or um, thousands and thousands of chickens in one barn. Those now dominate agricultural landscapes. Um, And these agricultural systems are specialized, right? So they're single, 
they have like a single focus, like they just grow chickens or they just grow canola. It's a large scale commodity. It's usually internationally traded. So those are crops like corn or canola or palm oil. And industrial means that there's a uniformity to these processes. Second, an industrial food system, um, it centers uniformity in specialization, and there's a reliance on industrial and processed inputs. So for example, chemical fertilizers and pesticides, the use of processed animal feed rather than grazing or chickens foraging for insects outside. And the intensity of this system, whether it's the inputs or the actual production, leads to water and land degradation. So for example, chemical fertilizer and manure flows into rivers and lakes. And there is a financial cost to all these inputs. So industrial agriculture requires large amounts of capital or money, often in the form of credit debt to support its ongoing production model. So large tractors, expensive seeds and other inputs large tracts of land, which means it's limited, it's limited to those who have capital. So in the industrial food system, once the food is grown, it is processed and manufactured into food. And that has another sustain, number of sustainability issues as well. Highly or ultra processed foods um, is key to the industrial food system. Manufacturers just don't make much money by selling a single potato, but they make lots of money from selling a bag of potato chips. And these processed foods require high energy inputs in the manufacturing and transportation. Finally, I would say, well, it's, I think this would be generally recognized, one of the most important characteristics of the industrial food system is that it's reliant on petrochemicals from fertilizer, from chemical fertilizers, to powering tractors, to manufacturing plastic pack packaging, to moving, distributing the food. It's estimated that these food systems contribute somewhere between 20 to almost 30% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the industrial food system. On the other end of the scale, we have, um, we can look at food systems, one that is diverse, one that is not wholly reliant on petrochemicals, and one that has more of a focus on human and animal labor rather than on machines. And we can turn to agroecology for that. So what is agroecology? Agroecology is a science of applying ecological concepts and principles to the design and management of sustainable food systems, right? So sustainability is at the center of agroecology. It recognizes that there are ecological concepts, not just economic concepts and principles to managing food systems. So the characteristics of that are um, a diversity, right? So there's multiple different crops grown at the same time. There's intercropping. There's mixed farming with animals and plants together. It's not specialized. It's not singular. And it's also labor intensive rather than capital intensive. It's often also local and small scale. So those would be the two big ends of the scale of sustainability that I would want to describe. Thanks so much, Sarah, for kind of laying that out to start with those two um, <clears throat> different paradigms, if you will, and two different uh, approaches to agriculture. And before we go to Helena, I just want to ask you one follow-up question. Um, we have spoken uh, on one of other, our other podcasts with uh, a senior vice president of a large uh, food manufacturing company who I think would respond to what you've just characterized. I don't know if he would completely disagree with it, but he would also point out that it's the large scale industrial system which has allowed a lot of food to be available cheaply for people. And so if we think about sustainability as including that social dimension, a lot of the food security that we experience in the world right now comes from arguably this large scale industrial system, though it may not, though it may have some costs associated with it that uh, environmentally speaking and otherwise. I wonder if you can just comment on on that, you know, because he, he also said, I'm not sure you can expect the, the smaller niche, small scale operations that you're talking about that maybe 
are more labor and human intensive, the agroecological operations to uh, supply the volume at price that people currently have, say, in the food system in Canada? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, so I think we can agree. I think we can agree if we look at California and the wildfires that climate change is an urgent issue. And we can't do things the way we have been doing them. And for sure, this productivist paradigm of the industrial food system has fed a lot of people. And yet, it's also produced and contributed to the crisis, the environmental crisis we find ourselves in right now. And so, number one, we have to think differently about this. And then number two, there is research out there that shows the vast majority of people around the globe are fed by small-scale um, agricultural producers or fishers or pastoralists. So the estimates are somewhere around 70% of the global population are fed by small-scale farmers. And those small-scale farmers use around 30% of the world's resource or agricultural resources to do that. On the other hand, there is um, uh, the same research shows that the industrial food system feeds about 30% of us very well, I would say, um, but it uses up around 70% of the agricultural resources. And so, yes, it is absolutely a fact that the industrial feed, food system feeds people. But that, I would say, is the wrong question. Does the industrial food system feed people? Yes, a simple answer. Does the industrial food sy system feed people well? Not particularly. Does it uh, sustain the environment? Not particularly well. Is there alternatives? Yes, there are. So I think uh, our hypothetical uh, senior uh, person from uh, the corporation, I think, would agree that there are a lot of problems with uh, the industrial system as we know it and uh, that there's a uh, huge scope for improvement. And, and the sense we got from our interview with, with him is that that's also uh, where things are going. Um, but I found it very interesting, your second point about uh, that most people around the planet are actually not fed through that system, but through... Uh, smaller scale production systems and local food systems. I, I think, uh, you know, I came across an interesting stat a number of years ago that most food doesn't cross international borders. Um, and so I think this is a this is a good place to bring Helena in. Uh, Helena, your work has focused to date on food and agricultural systems of Africa. And I'm wondering if you could say what role do African farmers play in the industrial, the global supply chains talked about by Sarah, and then I wonder also if, uh, to what extent, they are part of the uh, the smaller scale agroecological paradigm, if you will, or maybe something in between. Um, and of African farmers, uh, who are the smallholders? I know that a lot of your work focuses on smallholder farmers, so I wonder if you can describe that a bit and talk about what role that group of farmers plays in feeding people in Africa and beyond. Uh, yes, thank you so much for the question, Peter. And I really um, listened to Sarah's insights with uh, great interest. Maybe let me start by describing who are Africa's smallholder farmers, uh, as well as their role they play in feeding people in Africa and beyond, uh, as well as the challenges that they face. First of all, there are a few key factors that characterize smallholder farmers, or more accurately, let's say, small-scale producers. Namely, that the size of the land they occupy is considered small for their production and region. Um, they use, their use of mechanization is fairly limited, and they mainly rely on family labor for production. So smallholder farmers in Africa do play an important role in, in Africa's food systems, with some estimates showing that they need up to 80% of the population's food, uh, food needs. But while these smallholder farmers grow food to feed a significant proportion of the continent, they do so under difficult conditions, namely the impact of uh, climate change, they have limited economic opportunities, and they are often vulnerable to land disposition and other socioeconomic factors. So then the question of what role do African farmers play in global 
supply chains. It's relatively small, and we do see small pockets of farmers participating in niche markets of the global food supply chains. For example, coffee producers in coffee or cocoa beans or horticulture produce, such as fruits and vegetables, as well as as well as fresh cut flowers. Um, but while farmers grow a diversity of food, most of their production is primarily dedicated to staple crops. So cereal crops such as maize, roots and tubers, as well as rice in some regions of the continent such as West Africa. And in fact, many countries uh, on the continent have in place input subsidy programs to support increased production of these staple crops to feed Africa's growing population, particularly in cities. Um, and we see in the last decade and a half, really there has been a growing emphasis for Africa to modernize its agricultural sectors and to accelerate the adoption of improved technologies such as hybrid seeds, fertilizers, irrigations, some of the industrial based models that Sarah was describing. Um, and so this approach in Africa really has entail, entails integrating farmers into global supply chains, primarily as consumers of these technological inputs and services. And this has been evident with activities of the African Green Revolution, which has emerged in the mid to early uh, 2000s as primarily as an agricultural development initiative funded by donors such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundations to address challenges, challenges of low productivity and to increase rural incomes through investments in technology transfer and integrating smallholder producers into market value chains. So since this time, multiple other initiatives under the African Green Revolution, uh, under the African Green Revolution have emerged with largely the same purpose and are being implemented by a consortium of partners comprising African governments, the private sector and philanthropies, as well as multi, multilateral institutions. Among them is the Grow Africa Partnership of the World Economic Forum and the African Union Development Agency, which was launched in 2011, as well as the G7's new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, which was formed in 2012. So what is really striking uh, or important about this initiative is that they are facilitating the entry of agro-corporations into African agricultural markets, mainly to sell their products, as well as to integrate African production systems into the global supply chain. So for example, agro-corporations such as Syngenta, which merged with Camp China and Monsanto, which is now acquired by Bayer, have embedded themselves into these various agricultural development partnerships and frame some of their uh, technologies that they are developing, such as GM crops, as pro poor, uh, and as gifts donated to the agricultural development in Africa. So these agro-corporations also increasingly label their products as part of climate smart agriculture solutions, which can improve agricultural productivity, enhance farmers' adaptive capacity to climate change, and contribute to mitigate agricultural effects of greenhouse gas emissions. So some companies are even rebranding their technologies, such as transgenics and chemical fertilizers, and biochar and so on, as not only climate smart, but really imperative to addressing climate change and food insecurity. Helena, there, there is so much to unpack in what you just said. Um, and I just want to go back to where Sarah opened us up by suggesting there's kind of at least these two paradigms with a lot in between, admittedly, the industrial agricultural model of large scale, high input, high output, um, um, and often high consequences, environmental consequences, including uh, in the industrial agricultural model and food system. And then we have what she presented as the small scale agroecological, more eco friendly, but often local uh, uh, animal and human labor and so on. And uh, what you 
began describing are that a lot of Africa's farmers feeding up to 80% of the population are more likely on that smaller scale end with the small scale practices. Um, and Sarah presented that as perhaps the more sustainable in the big picture for the planet. And yet what you're suggesting is that there's a whole move to have them move from where they are now to become more part of the industrial system. And I, and, and I think there's a, there's a couple of things we need to understand in the middle there. Uh, one is that perhaps the, that small scale system for many of Africa's farmers, is, is it perhaps not as, as sustainable or idyllic as uh, the, you know, the, the sort of dualism that Sarah set up um, would suggest? Are they having a lot of challenges either meeting the, the food needs of the, uh, the population and or um, having sustainable livelihoods for themselves? Like what, what is the impetus that is leading um, all of these organizations to want to invest so heavily? That's the one question. And then the second one is um, you also suggested that maybe some of the ways that these companies are characterizing their interventions is not exactly along the industrial model that Sarah was presenting. They're trying to create a, a pro-poor version of that model. And I just wonder if you can give us a sense of what that looks like. What's different in the model that they're proposing? Thank you so much, Peter, again, for these two questions. And to go to the first question, what is the impetus to really move uh, farmers to, say, integrate, be more integrated in the global food supply chain, is really we do have very compelling calls, both from African governments, from development uh, research organizations, uh, and many actors, yes, who are in fact saying that African smallholder production system cannot meet that challenge to even, first of all, to feed themselves adequately, but even more importantly, perhaps to feed Africa's growing cities. Um, and we know globally, either with, through the industrial food model that Sarah was describing, as well as the more agroecological models of food system, really we still face significant challenges in the ability of people to access adequate food. Um, and the challenge is even more pronounced for people to afford healthy diets. So according to the new uh, state of food security and nutrition in the world, which is the SOFI report by the UN Food and Agriculture Organizations, together with the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, and other UN-based agencies, healthy diets are unaffordable for more than 3 billion people in the world. Now, we know that most of the number of people who cannot afford a healthy diet are, of course, in poor countries in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America, as food access is so closely tied to income and people's ability to purchase it. So in Africa, for instance, the SOFI report that I just mentioned earlier shows that some 965 million people, or over 57% percent of the population cannot afford a healthy diet. Um, but however, I want to emphasize that this is a global challenge and we see pockets of hunger and lack of access to healthy diets in Canada and in wealthy countries as well. So I think these compelling statistics that we have such inadequacy to meet our food needs really is also driving, as I mentioned, this impetus to integrate Africa's smallholder farmers more into global value chains, to in not only to intensify their productivity, um, yes, through the use of improved uh, technologies, improved inputs, and so on, but as I've mentioned, to be able to feed Africa's cities. It sounds like the uh, Gates Foundation and some of the other agrochemical uh, companies that have all been getting involved in trying to increase productivity in Africa, you mentioned that they sort of have a pro-poor approach. And I just wonder, do you see any signs, maybe to just put it most simply, that they are doing, suggesting some strategies forward that truly are pro-poor and maybe even climate smart, taking that at its face value, um, compared to uh, the more intensive and probably more destructive and less sustainable model that Sarah was describing earlier. Um, these initiatives maybe have can have arguably been pro poor because they, we see greater investment 
and breeding towards staple crops that African producers and consumers do eat, such as orange plus orange fleshed sweet potatoes, um, some roots and tubers, and so on. But we also see that some some other traditional crops have been neglected, such as millet and and sorghum. Um, but overall, really, the we also see critique that even then there is still a narrow focus on cereal and staple crops, but really less less emphasis or there has not been as a diversified investment to really get us to this kind of healthy and nutrition, nutritious diet that I was referring to that the SOFIE report suggests. Okay, thank you very much. And I think it is getting clearer for me in my head that, uh, you know, going back to the original dualism that Sarah set up of the industrial versus the agroecological model, it sounds to me like what you're describing are is that um, small scale producers in Africa are being encouraged <laughs> towards the industrial model. Um, albeit with some changes and with some attention to the, the particularities of their, uh, you know, locally appropriate uh, foods, which might not be uh, maize and and, uh, and the wheat that uh, is grown largely in the industrial food system and the rice. Um, and yet still uh, the, the efforts don't go all that far and there's still blinders towards uh, an input intensive, probably uh, maybe output intensive, ideally, uh, system that is not fully ecological in the way that some of the ad advocates for an agroecological system would argue. I'd, I'd like to switch uh, gears a little bit here um, because we are in interviewing right now and doing recording this podcast in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've seen a lot of um, the, maybe the strengths and also the weaknesses of our food system emerge in the last number of months as we've gone through the pandemic. Uh, both of you have raised issues that speak to the resilience of food systems in the face of these kind of external shocks uh, in terms of the virus itself with the COVID-19. And then we've also seen the effects on food system workers around the world and in terms of the economic impacts of lockdowns and disruptions to supply chains. Helena, what have you seen arise in the context of the pandemic that speaks to the sustainability of our food systems? Again, the impact of COVID-19 uh, on Africa's agricultural and food system is a great concern for the continent. The immediate impact is, of course, that millions of people in major African cities, such as Nairobi, Lagos and Kinshasa, who rely on the informal sector for their livelihood, with estimates showing that this is up to two-thirds of the population, have been left without income due to their abrupt loss of jobs um, that often provide a daily earnings. And in some countries uh, where informal markets uh, really provide, you know, is the source of uh, food for most low-income uh, populations, these markets have been completely closed or so reduced operating hours. This has really made it difficult for low income urban dwellers who depend on these systems to access critical food supplies. Uh, and in rural areas where agriculture is the main source of people's livelihoods, disruptions to the transportation systems as well as logistics have made it really difficult for producers not only to get access to important agricultural inputs, but it has also disrupted their ability to um, transport their produce to, to more lucrative markets in cities. Um, and they have also faced higher transportation costs. Uh, and we have seen this in Nairobi, where I am. And so the so just to answer your question, really, the COVID pandemic has put a further strain on Africa's agricultural systems, which were already facing unfavorable climate change patterns, including higher frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as droughts and floods, as well as market and price volatility. Uh, and then even in, in the Horn of Africa and East Africa, we have also recently seen uh, desert locusts, which have completely devastated production systems. So um, I think 
so maybe speaking more specifically the question of sustainability it's really challenging and i think this also gives us a chance to think about okay when when we are cut off from say the global supply chain what what can we do in the local context that we have so that we are not so vulnerable so that when uh, there is a disruption to the supply chains you know agricultural activities do not come to a complete halt I can hear from your response that it's a hugely challenging context. Um, as you say, this, the agricultural and food systems are already so vulnerable. Um, they are now being impacted by climate change uh, and uh, other situations like the locusts and who knows how that fits in with larger environmental change. Uh, And then you throw the pandemic on top of that, which throws so many people out of their livelihoods, disrupts transportation systems. It, it, It sounds like a hugely challenging situation for the producers themselves and the policymakers who are trying to uh, wrestle with it as well. Sarah, I'd like to turn to you. What have you seen arisen in, in the pandemic that shows uh, cracks in the food system from a sustainability perspective? Uh, Thanks, Peter. Uh, Yeah, it's a huge question. Yeah. So I think food systems are a reflection of two important dynamics. First, the political economic structures, and second, the environmental infrastructures on which it depends. Um, And together, these two dynamics come together in a food system. So what I would argue is that the political economic systems really shape environmental sustainability. So many scholars who examine food systems, they think about the food system as a um, hourglass rather than a chain. And I think this is a really important way to think about food systems, especially in regard to the pandemic, because we see these headlines that say the food system is broken, the food chain is broken. And it's like when we talk about the food chain, it sounds like it's a whole bunch of links that are equal. And it's not. If we think about the food system as a hourglass, we start thinking about these cracks differently. So how does that hourglass work? At the top of the hourglass where it's wide, you have a lot of feeders, right? The producers, the fishers, the pastoralists, the farmers. In the middle, where it's pinched, you have a number of large corporations, often monopolies or oligopolies, that shape what the people on the bottom, who are the feeders, the consumers, actually can have access to. And so even though we talk about the food chain and we saw lots of um, headlines about this food chain being broken, I would say who is the food, who is producing this idea of the food chain being broken, especially in the context of the pandemic? The pandemic has just illuminated the cracks that were already there. And What happens is, for example, Tyson, which is a large meat packer in the States, took out a full page ad in the Washington Post and said, oh, my goodness, the food chain is broken. We need support from the government. And when, in fact, what is actually happening is Tyson has a huge amount of control. They make tons of profits and they are putting their workers during the pandemic on the line and their health and the health of the animals that they work with is in question. I am concerned that the long-term social and environmental policies that could slow environmental degradation and could assure worker safety are being set aside in this emergency. And the people who are being listened to are large corporations who have a particular interest in not necessarily supporting environmental policies and not necessarily supporting workers' rights, but in fact exploiting those resources. And on the one hand, we have uh, research that shows that work, especially on environmental racism, that poor racialized people have less access to quality foods, and that is worsening. On the other hand, we have research that shows that the wealthy have a much higher impact and a negative one on environment. So while the pandemic is an emergency, it is also widening cracks that are already in the food system, and they're in highlighting inequality that has been on the go for decades. Thanks, Sarah. Your response really uh, brings into the forefront uh, the political economy of the food system. I'd like to turn now back to Helena. 
Helena, earlier on, you did a great job of, of laying out um, the position of uh, small-scale producers in Africa and um, talked about how a number of actors, including the Gates Foundation and agri-food corporations, our, our uh, input corporations in particular, have been um, working to assist, we'll put that to in, in quotes, these farmers to develop a, a new direction. Um, but I also know that in your work uh, that you've examined other organizations that are also working with small-scale farmers and um, perhaps pushing them in, in other directions. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, uh, organizations associated with La Via Campesina, the, the world's largest social movement comprised of uh, small-scale uh, peasants and and fisher folk from around the world. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about, um, if you want, these two different trajectories that are being proposed for African farmers, how African farmers see them, and how you think they uh, they fit in with uh, the future that lies ahead. Thank you for that one. That's a great question, Peter. And first, let me just speak briefly to uh, the work of La Via Campesina in Africa. This movement first uh, came on the continent in 2004 when African-based peasant organizations and movements have joined the movement. So we see this, for example, through ROPA, which is the network of West African peasant organizations uh, and producers, as well as the National Union of Mozambican Peasants, which were really two, two of the first African-based movements uh, that joined La Via Campesina. But in 2011, Africa's food sovereignty groups consolidated to establish the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, uh, AFSA, as well as to promote agroecology as their preferred production model on the continent. So today, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa comprises 40 member networks who are active in 50 countries, on the continent representing some 200 million people. So the African um, Food Sovereignty Alliance and its members really has made important contributions to raising the profile of food sovereignty and agroecology in Africa, particularly in some key regional and international policy spaces, such as the Committee on World Food Security, the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as well as to the Sustainable Development Goals Center for Africa, among others. However, the African Food Sovereignty Alliance really has seen limited access to critical policy spaces at the national level and regional levels in Africa where important agricultural decisions are made and implemented. And this really speaks to a broader challenge facing agrarian social movements in Africa, where we see that overall they lack political agency and financial, financial autonomy needed to operationalize food sovereignty, let alone make this model an alternative to mainstream industrial agricultural models that some of its allies envision it to be. So earlier I was talking about initiatives from the African Green Revolution that are funded by institutions such as, or organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that really receive massive amounts of uh, funding that runs into billions and billions of dollars and really have that kind of political clout in Africa. And really this kind, the kind of influence they have completely pales to what Africa's uh, agrarian social movement or food sovereignty really can do have. And so then as a result of that, you know, some of, we see that some food sovereignty groups in Africa really engage in actions and strategies that round, that even run counter to the principles of food sovereignty, such as collaborating with some of these green revolution initiatives. Uh, really, again, due to the agency constraints uh, that they face, as well as the environments in which they operate, where the powerful actors are unconducive to the social movement's radical claims. Um, and so the best thing they do really is to form these alliances that are largely apolitical, 
and in some ways even help Africa smallholder farmers gain access to uh, agricultural inputs and technologies uh, promoted by the African Green Revolution uh, initiatives and so on. And, and this is even more emblematic to how Africa's own smallholder farmers are, are responding because they, when they are so constrained, when they have so little access to resources and such limited support from their governments and institutions, really they would work with whoever that can give them support for that day, whether it's to help them increase their productivity, whether it's to help them link to markets. At the ground level for them, is really about, okay, who can help us increase productivity, who can help us uh, gain access to markets, which are so, so important. You know, African farmers do have to increase their productivity and they do have to be linked to markets because oftentimes this is the only source of livelihood that they have, you know. So they do have to sell their produce to markets because then they also have to earn money to send their kids to school, to buy medicine, to buy all kinds of other uh, materials. Um, and there is really no way they can be entirely self-sufficient. What I hear you describing is limited agency and limited voice for Africa's small-scale farmers. And I think that um, their ability to shape their futures is quite constrained. They have a lot of people, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and many others uh, on that track who are encouraging them to go into one direction. Uh, La Via Campesina and some of the social movements uh, wanting to propose a different direction. And uh, they seem, sounds like they're a bit stuck in between, uh, taking support where they can get it uh, from day to day. Um, and as a result, having a limited ability to shape their own futures. I'd like to turn to Sarah now. And if you can briefly talk about what is, what is this move, this call for food sovereignty in the food system? What have you seen that it looks like in Canada? I think it's really fascinating. So I think that there's um, there's a political choice we can make. So I've talked a lot about powerful actors within the food system. Helena just talked about the food sovereignty movement um, being constrained uh, in Africa. And I think we can make a choice to think about power in particular ways. So when we think about the food movement in Canada, I would argue that it's actually made a fairly significant contribution in the sense that it has been going on since the mid-90s, 1990s, and it takes a long time for social movements to make an impact. But I would suggest that the food sovereignty movement has shaped public policy, national pub public policy in Canada, and contributed to the fact that we now have a national food policy. And that's a recent development. And I think when we need, when we look at social movements, we can make a choice to think about the power a little bit differently. We have to track the power over a long, long period of time so that it can look insignificant in the 1990s. It can even, even look significant in the 2000s. But when you actually shape national policy, I think that you, you can see how the food sovereignty movement has actually made a difference. So I think that there's a really powerful discourse of food sovereignty. And Peter, you're very familiar with this. You've done tons of work in this area. Um, that I think it's important as academics for us to illuminate the kind of power social movements have, how they operate, and not only identify how they're constrained, as Helena has done, but also identify the inroads and power that they have. As you've uh, pointed out, Sarah, I have done some work in this area, and I, I just want to fill in a couple of gaps for our listeners. Uh, one is this idea of food sovereignty. Many will be familiar with it. Others may not. Um, the short form, we might say, is the ability of people or peoples to uh, shape their own food systems uh, according to their own uh, priorities, which often include uh, environmental and social priorities, uh, rather than have that based purely in uh, in markets, which is uh, the other guiding hand in the in our food system relations. Um, and you also pointed that we Canada now has a national food policy, and it, and it is worth pointing out this is a, a recent development as of the last year. Um, What's significant about it, it is uh, the first time that our Canadian government has tried to bring 
and I would emphasize the word tried there, but nonetheless, bring an integrated view to um, the way the relationship between how we produce food in this country uh, and who gets food and who consumes food and how healthy that food is uh, for them. Um, and along the way, there are a number of new programs that were created as part of the national food policy, um, supporting indigenous and northern communities with uh, their food production and processing and community freezers and those kind of things, supporting small scale local food efforts in other parts of the country. Um, and, uh, the, you know, it's far from perfect, the first iteration of Canada's national food policy. But nonetheless, as you point out, Sarah, it was pushed for social movement actors and uh, was realized in federal policy in a way that's really uh, a step different from what the government had been doing for the last 50 or 60 years. So uh, we're nearing the end of this podcast, and I want to end with giving... Uh, uh, each of you a chance to talk a bit about uh, what you see as the paths forward. What do you see as potential solutions to some of the food system challenges you've raised today? Uh, you're both critics of uh, the systems that are in place, critics of some of the initiatives trying to uh, uh, improve the system from the point of view of some food system actors. And I just wonder where you see uh, from your critical vantage point uh, the the brighter lights or the possible solutions that you think needs more attention and effort. So I'll pass it to you first, Helena, for this final question. Okay, thank you, Peter. I think possible path forwards in Africa would really entail increased funding and investment towards national agricultural research systems, as this will be uh, crucial to addressing some of the food system challenges that the continent uh, faces that I have raised. So really, there is no place for that, to have strong national systems that really take this work forward. Um, but currently, many of these institution continue, institutions continue to face numerous challenges, including low levels of public investments, dependence on external donors and philanthropies who make demands or drive the agenda, so on. Um, as well as just generally volatility in funding flows. So really, they cannot have a consistent um, agriculture and research development agenda that they can really drive. So anyways, even in a recent report by the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems and Biovision, uh, which really look at where funding flows uh, go in Africa, Really, the authors have found that the amount of development aid channel into agricultural research, education, and extension has stagnated over the last 10 years, representing only 14% of agricultural aid in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2017. But the report also found that um, agroecology, you know, alternative and alternative forms of food systems that Sarah has described about, that I've also talked about, really remain marginal within many uh, funding initiatives by donors. One of that is, of course, agroecology. And we see that as many as 85% of the projects funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and more than 70% of projects carried out here in Kenya's research institutions were limited to supporting industrial agriculture and increasing its efficiency via targeted approaches such as improved pesticide practices, improved um, seeds and so on, livestock vaccines, as well as reductions in, say, post-harvest losses. Uh, these investments, of course, are important. I'm not denying that. But when we see such a huge discrepancy and such limited support, to some of these alternative food systems that even Africa's own social movements and farmers are, are calling for is problematic and really we need to change this. But of course, it's hope, I'm hopeful that there's a handful of donors, um, such as the Food and Agriculture of the, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, who are starting to expli explicitly recognize agroecology as a key solution for building sustainable food system. So there is some um, recognition there, which is important. It's an important point to start the conversation. 
Um, but I think more than anything, too, we also need research to continue to document um, the evidence that is coming from agroecology as well as alternative solutions. I think the path in Africa is that really there's an emphasis and there's a lot of support for agro-based um, agricultural models, which is fine if it can feed people more effectively and adequately, but there are also other models, and I think those other models also deserve to be given a chance. They deserve to be supported, and I'm really glad that this conversation is starting to happen. Thanks, Helena. So what I'm hearing from you is, on the one hand, invest in national agricultural research infrastructure. On the other hand, that research infrastructure has not always uh, been pursuing a diversity of pathways. And what I'm hearing you argue for is that that the we need a br wider array of uh, paths being identified and pursued going forward, um, and particularly that those associated with this agroecological model deserve attention. They may not solve everything, but they deserve uh, the time of day to really uh, be worked through. And this is uh, really something that even can, students in Canadian context can think about, you know, whether they might like to play a role in that moving forward in terms of their own research energies. So um, that's really that's really helpful and inspiring. I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. What do you as some of, see as some of the pathways forward? And uh, do you have any advice for uh, listeners who might be charting to charting their own paths in all of this? Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's a great question. So I agree with Helena. 100% on this. Uh, the way I'm thinking about it is that, you know, we need to reimagine and also carefully reflect on sustainable food systems that support health, that support social justice, and the environment on multiple scales. And so while I started out with this idea of like, there's this industrial system, and then there's this amazing agroecology, sort of a romantic view that it's all perfect. That, you know, of course, it's not this kind of binary. There's multiple, multiple ways that food systems can operate with the environment changing because of climate change. We need everyone to be reimagining and thinking differently about our food and our food systems. Ursula Le Guin says, to oppose something is to maintain it. You must go somewhere else. You must have another goal and then you walk a different road. And here is the opportunity, not only within this environmental, this um, climate emergency, not only within the context of a pandemic, but we have an opportunity to have the industrial food system step back and let's see what grows. Let's see what indigenous food sovereignty looks like. Let's see what Newfoundland Labrador food sovereignty looks like. What, let's look at what Toronto food sovereignty looks like. Let's have a democratic system where we all have a voice and we can all use our imaginations to think about and work towards a better, more socially just food system. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thanks for those inspiring words from uh, Ursula Le Guin. What I take as uh, the key ideas from the two of you, you know, the global food system is very complex. It is many systems. It looks quite differently in different parts of the world. In Africa, where Helena brought, uh, brought our gaze, we see the complexity and the challenges and how small scale producers have the least control and least say in what those systems look like. And yet what I'm also hearing from both of you is around the world, people are experimenting and exploring and that we basically have to open that up in the context of a climate emergency. This is a time to keep exploring multiple alternative pathways and not just uh, narrow in on one narrow set of technologies uh, because almost inevitably in this day and age uh, that suits particular players in the food system and it may not benefit us all collectively. And so I hear that uh, democratic plea at the end of your, uh, your words as well, Sarah. So thanks for that. So I'd like to thank both Helena Shilomboleni and Sarah Martin for joining us today on the Ecopolitics podcast. We welcome from listeners your feedback on this episode. Check out the website to see the many other episodes in the series and have a great day to our listeners. Bye-bye. Thank you.